Thank you, everyone, for coming today. It is an honor to be here. A uh, huge thanks to uh, BNH, Limblad Expeditions, Nat Geo Expeditions, and uh, to Data Color, who has asked me to participate in Optic 2017. Uh, I'm a freelance photographer uh, based in Washington, DC. And um, I have the fortunate ability to just travel around the world and, and tell stories. And something I'm going to do uh, during this talk is talk more about the, the approach to it. Um, how do you get into a particular culture? How do you get close to people? How do you make those images uh, that really resonate? Um, and a lot of times when, uh, when I'm traveling around the world, I see situations like this, uh, where people come up, they see something interesting, and they have their photo taken with someone. Uh, but with a camera and with our travels, the camera is a tool that we can go to a faraway place and bring that close to us. We can bring those images back to our friends, back to our family, share those stories, and inspire them to travel as well. So my question is, when we get this physically close to somebody, we can use that opportunity to really engage, to understand who they are, what they do, why they live the way they do. And I'm kind of more of the behind the scenes guy. Um, who are those people that are up there posing? What is their life like? This was in uh, Cambodia, in Angkor Wat. And I use my camera as a way to interact with those folks. Uh, and I want to use it to, to approach them and, and understand who they are and what they do. So. That's going to be um, the, basically the um, presence of my talk today. Uh, so how did I get to uh, this particular mentality? So I'll tell you a little story. Um, I wasn't always a photographer. Uh, be before becoming a photographer, I was a mechanical engineer. And I was working with an international company, traveling around the world, uh, destroying chemical weapons and securing biological weapons. And one day, a couple years into my career, a manager called me up and said, hey, Eric, do you want to go to Uzbekistan? And on a whim, I said, sure, sure, send me. And after he hung up the phone, I opened Google Maps, and I typed in <laughs> Uzbekistan. And I was in my mid-20s. I honestly, I wasn't, a, I wasn't a geography guy. I didn't know where Uzbekistan was. I will admit that. Um, I grew up in uh, uh, the suburbs of Baltimore. And I didn't have much uh, experience traveling internationally. So when I had this opportunity to go across the Atlantic, almost 6,500 miles as the crow flies, um, I knew my life was going to change. And uh, I went on a whim. And about I spent five and a half years over there. It was supposed to be a six-month job. And I fell in love with it. And I imagined the day about three years in when there was a rumor that our funding was going to get cut. Um, I imagine the day coming home, sitting down with my parents, and having them ask me the question, what was Uzbekistan like? What was your life like there? How do you describe that to somebody who's never been there, maybe never been to Central Asia? And I thought, you know what? The easiest way to do that is to take pictures. Picture speaks a thousand words, right? But unfortunately, I had zero experience with photography, and I had zero community within Uzbekistan and the other countries where I lived to garner that information and the education. So like any person, I opened up Google, relied on it before, relied on it again, and I typed in learn travel photography best. And I hit enter. And I'll give you one guess as to what the first result in Google was. Linda.com. Not lynda.com, National Geographic Expeditions. Learn travel photography from some of the best photographers in the world, was the subtext. And I thought, hey, if it's good for National Geographic, it's definitely going to be good enough for me. I know nothing about photography. So I went on a 17-day 17 day trip throughout India, and I was learning from three different Nat Geo contributors. I had no idea what an aperture was. I had no idea what ISO meant. But I had these folks who dedicated their time and inspired me and just gave their information literally 24 seven um, during those 17 days. But on the fifth day, they taught me about perspective and looking at things in a different way. And I made this picture. And I got really, really lucky with the flock of birds that flew overhead, I will admit. Um, so fast forward a bit, and I got home. And one of the experts sent me an email 
and in the, or in the uh, subject line it said enter this. And in the text, the body text, there was just a hyperlink. And it was a link to a photo contest sponsored by National Geographic Expeditions. I said, you know what, I can do this. I, so I entered this picture and I waited. And I was so excited about photography from that trip that I booked my next trip within, I don't know, weeks or a month to head over to Bhutan. And it was just a love for it. I just wanted to go. I just wanted to practice. I wanted to explore. I wanted to meet new people. I wanted to see light. I wanted to understand the landscape. And I, I wandered. I wandered with another group. Um, and it was really an opportunity to hone my skills. And eventually, I met these two in a village. And uh, after the trip, I came back. And I got an announcement from National Geographic. Congratulations, it said. Your picture of the tightrope walker in India has won the grand prize, the contest. And it was an all expense paid trip for two to Alaska. It really does happen. You see these things for contests all the time. It really does happen. Um, the proof to the pudding, I was one of those guys who won. Uh, so I thought it worked once, maybe it'll work again. So I did my research, I found out the contest was held every few months. And I submitted this picture, and I waited. Um, and I was hoping for, OK, when's this Alaska trip going to happen? And I waited. And a couple months later, I got an announcement from National Geographic. And it said, congratulations. Your picture of the two girls in the village of Bhutan have won, has won an honorable mention. It was a cash prize that you could put toward a future expedition. So off I went to Alaska um, and, and learned from another National Geographic contributing photographer. And again, this was just an opportunity to explore, an opportunity to practice my photography. Got a chance to meet Bobo the bear. Um, and eventually, I made this image. Um, the story about this one, the night before I made this one, this is in the middle of the summer, uh, about 11 o'clock at night. It's a 30 second exposure. And the night before, there was a woman out here. Same exact composition, but she was wearing all black. and the light uh, was just a little bit different. The hues of the blue were definitely different. I thought, you know what? I need to come back the next day. Uh, it just didn't seem to work with me. And I set up my tripod, set up the camera, everything. And this happens to me, my, be my brother. He walked out and, and stood in the same, same spot. And it just worked. The complementary colors, the red, blue, it was just a more successful picture, I thought. So think about that when you're out photographing. Um, it's always nice to go back and revisit a spot. You'll see it in a different way. So I came home, I thought, well, it worked two times. Did my research, found out when the next contest was, and I submitted that picture of my brother to a Nat Geo Expeditions photo contest. I waited. A couple months later, I got an announcement. Congratulations, your picture of uh, Tranquility at Twilight, is what the name of that one was, has won an honorable mention cash prize uh, to go on a future expedition. So I combined those two cash prizes. And then I sent myself to Cuba um, on another expedition. And this was very much uh, street photography. So how do you show up in a country or a place not knowing very much about the people or the landscape or the culture and get literally this close to folks and, um, and have them show you your, their tattoos and, and interact with people? And how do you get these nice intimate, um, intimate moments of, of people of all, of all ages um, just kind of playing uh, innocence there, um, looking at uh, gesture and light and composition and lines and, and frames within frames. Um, and then portraits. This was actually a portrait um, that I asked this husband and wife to make. And when's the best, the best opportunity to make a portrait? Right after you say you're done, or right after you say thank you. Because as you got camera up to your eye, you're starting to lose that connectivity. You're no longer looking eye to eye. That's when we really connect with people. But right when you say cheese or look in the camera, look over here, everyone's self-conscious. Everyone kind of goes like this. But then once you say you're done, uh, people kind of go back to the way they were. And that's exactly what happened here. And it just kind of changes the dynamic. What's on her mind? What's on his mind? Um, so I think that's sometimes the best, the best chance to take a, 
to make somebody's portrait. So eventually I came across these guys. And uh, when I was growing up in Maryland, I grew up with Cal Ripken and baseball. And I wanted to be an all-star shortstop. Um, it definitely didn't happen. Otherwise, I certainly wouldn't be here. Um, but I used that experience. I used that interest co to connect with these guys. And it got me an opportunity to literally be this close to them and lay on the ground a foot from his feet, three feet from horse manure, and just wait for the moment to happen. Just wait for it to happen. And I made, I made many images, because the, the leg would come in, the hand would come in, they wouldn't make contact with the ball as a wild pitch, whatever. Um, but finding those commonalities when you're out meeting people is hugely important. How do you get close to someone? Well, you start, start up a conversation. Find something of common interest. So I got home from this one, and I thought, well, it worked three times. <laughs> Let's try this one again. I did my research, figured out when the next contest was, submitted this picture, and it won the grand prize, a trip for two to Alaska. Oh, no, I'm sorry, two Galapagos. Um, all expenses paid for two people, and off I went to the Galapagos. That whole story, I was still an engineer. I was playing. I was practicing. I was honing skills. I was exploring. And then shortly thereafter, between Cuba and Galapagos, I said, you know what? It was about a three and a half year time span from the time I went to India. I resigned, and I changed careers. I said, you know what? I'm doing this. Because I remember at the end of India, I went up to Steve Winter, who was my um, expert, um, and I said, I want your job. You inspired me so much. This trip has been amazing. I want your job. And I worked toward it through all of this practice, going on these expeditions, and I worked really hard to go after that. So while I was overseas, I was five and a half years, what I realized was my life was changing. My outlook was changing. I was a complete fish out of water. I was an outsider. I'm in Central Asia. I was in Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Georgia, Turkey, Russia, working and living, and I, I never fully felt accepted. So after five and a half years, when I decided to come back, I was coming back to a country that I didn't really understand anymore. Things that I loved before I came back, I didn't really love them again. So it was this reverse culture shock, and I really tried to tap into that and understand those thoughts, those feelings that went into, what is it like to be kind of an outsider? How do I use the camera to get in and feel included. So a little thing I did was I drove across America from Maryland all the way to the West Coast, and I made it to Cody, Wyoming. And that night, I experienced my first ever rodeo. We don't have that in Reisterstown, Maryland. Um, and I fell in love with it. I showed up, sneakers, shorts, t-shirt, baseball cap, camera, camera. And I walk into this arena, and literally, the music stops. And everybody just, no belt buckle, no hat. I didn't, I didn't fit the part. But I went up to some of the people um, who were in kind of the box, the announcers. And I was just honest with them. I was like, hey, I'm exploring the subcultures of America. Can I wander around? Can I meet people? Can I photograph the sport? Can I photograph the Cowboys? It's like, yeah, sure, do it. Um, they were so supportive. It was awesome. So after that night, I completely backtracked and diverted where I was going to go. I went to Crow Agency um, in Montana, Deer Lodge, Montana, which is a little backyard, um, very small, kind of intimate um, rodeo ground. And eventually, I found my way over to Pendleton, Oregon, um, where I just continued to, to practice. Um, and I remember walking up, and there was a media trailer. And I thought, well, it worked once before. Let's try it again. So I walked in there, and I just told the guys, like, hey, I'm here. I'm documenting my trip. I'm exploring subcultures. Can I get a media pass? Like, yeah, sure. Here it is. Here's where you can go. Here's where you can't go. If you had a cowboy hat and boots and jeans and a long sleeve shirt and a buckle, we could get you even more access. <laughs> so the next time I went back to Pendleton, what do you think I did? I went, boots, cowboy hat, buckle. Um, and I started, to, I started to integrate myself into these situations. Um, but the entire time, this was just this was an exploration of 
who I was and how I felt and what kind of subcultures I could get into um, and explore. Um, and this work went on for probably a year and a half, uh, but it was all in my backyard. I didn't have to go to Bhutan. I didn't have to go to India, Galapagos, Cuba. All of these rodeo grounds, they were probably within 45 minutes to an hour. So as we go off and travel and we bring stuff back, we can continue to practice and hone our skills right in our backyard. Um, and that's what I continue, continue to do. Um, so eventually, I show up at a rodeo in um, southeast Washington. And as part of the fairgrounds, you've probably all seen this, there was a carnival in town. And I was sitting with an engineering friend of mine at the time, and I said, this is fascinating. How do these people come in and set up a carnival, operate it for a week, tear down, and move? How do they travel from place to place? How do they make it work? And she said to me, well, a friend of mine just married into this carnival family. Do you want to know? I was like, yeah, let's go. Let's, let's go do it. So she introduced me to the carnival, and uh, I basically pitched an idea to him. I was, again, very genuine, very honest. I want to know what it's like to be you guys. How do you live? How do you work? How do you, how do you execute all of these things? Um, and it took a little while, but they warmed up to it because it was a family-run business. And they said, yeah, you can come. You can be one of us. So for three months, I traveled around the Pacific Northwest, and I became a carnival worker. Uh, one day a week, on Sunday, I became the truck driver. And I'd pull the ice cream parlor. I would pull the ticket booths, uh, whatever I need to do. And the other days, I could just hang out with them. And the fascinating thing about this was sitting down with people. And I would interview people. How did you get here? What was your life path? How do you end up in the carnival? And the stories were phenomenal. A chef, Las Vegas Hotel five-star restaurant, got fed up with the pressure, wanted an easier job, wanted to see more of America, wanted to interact with people face-to-face, -face, not behind in the kitchen. He runs the kitty rides. I mean, hearing these stories, I was absolutely blown away, absolutely blown away. Um, so what I tried to do, and I, was, I, I told the family right up front, I want to give an honest portrayal of what it's like. What's the family life like? What's the work life? What are the accommodations like? This is the, uh, the belly of a trailer that houses the merry-go-round. In these slots, you have the poles that hold up the horses. Once the ride is erect, it becomes shelter for some of the workers. So really getting an insight into people and their lives, getting close to them, and really showing um, the honest way of life, um, the interaction with worker and, and the public. Um, as well. So again, I'm still exploring. This was the first um, kind of long-term project that I did uh, after I resigned. And um, yeah, I was super excited to do it and, and give that kind of honest look um, into what it's like to, to travel around with the carnival. Uh, it is a family business. How do you show three generations together that, that travel and work? It's just, just one way to do it. And um, it's a summertime thing, so uh, the kids go out as well. So after this, I thought, OK, how do I combine photography, travel, and teaching? Uh, and I came across through those, ex um, excuse me, the experience with National Geographic Expeditions. I learned that there's a student program, a high school program. I thought, hey, that's a good entry level into combining these three passions that I've been, that I've been looking at. So um, one of the things I do now in my fourth year is I teach high school students. Um, I take them around the world um, in the summer months. And I teach them photography. And I put them into situations like this. No one was harmed, of course. Um, but one of the takeaways is, and I say it to them, they're 14 to 18 years old, is when you go into a particular um, position like this, whether you're on the street interacting with strangers, is you can come up to somebody and easily say, hey, look, I'm practicing photography. May I take your portrait? May I look into your shop? I, I'm, just, I'm just learning. I'm practicing. And it's amazing how many people respond to that and say yes. So the students would walk up and say, hey, I'm a National Geographic photographer. I want to learn, and I'm practicing. And uh, it was amazing the access that they would get um, just by being honest that um, they're on a National Geographic expedition, 
and, and they want to hone their skills. Um, so that's something, one of the things I do now, um, I still think I'm practicing. Every day I go out on a shoot, um, I'm still learning all the time, photo, video, editing, um, new technologies, it's constantly changing. So um, I, I embrace that uh, myself because I'm still a student, I consider. Um, fast forward a bit, and there was a workshop that I attended in Missouri, small town Missouri. They've been putting it on for about seven decades now. So when it started, it was the film days. Now we're all in digital. The rules that they had from film days still apply. Come into town, find a story, and photograph it in 400 frames. 400 frames. I know a lot of us, when we go on a travel expedition, we can easily make 400 pictures in a morning or at lunchtime. So what it did is it forced me to literally knock on doors. And I, I went through businesses. I went to people's houses. Now imagine being home and having a photographer knock on your door and say, hey, what's your story? I'm interested in you. May I follow you around for the next four days and photograph your life? And I always have to remind myself as I ask people this, I say, hey, what's your life like? What's the interaction with you and your family and your business? I have to remind myself that what I'm asking is a lot. They're letting me into their lives. And I found these two brothers who've been working in a donut shop all of their lives, almost 40 years. It was a family-run business. And I asked them that, and they said, yeah, sure. Sure, we can come. We can hang out. You can go hunting with us. You can come into the shop. We can make donuts together. Uh, and, and you can really start to see um, what our life is like. So one of the things that really resonated with me during this, um, during this workshop, somebody taught me this. Um, and we know the friends I said it, or we know the phrase I said it earlier, a picture speaks a thousand words. Well, in a sentence, we've got nouns, we have verbs, we have adjectives, we have adverbs. So if you want your picture to really resonate all of those things, start to think about what's happening in your frame. Nouns, person, light, ship, building. What are those things doing? Jumping, running. Uh, the tough ones are the adjective and adverb. How do you bring those into your picture? And I think those are the two that really elevate your image to the next level. Adjective, how do you, sh how do you capture beauty? Can you do it through light? Can you do it through color? Can you do it through tension? Can you do it through composition? Adverbs. Start to think about gestures. Start to think about how people do things. The adverb, how you do an action. Is it aggressively? Is it gently? Um, so as, as you start to integrate those into your pictures, I really think they're going to get elevated from, from good images to great images. So those are the things that I think about. And the 400 frames, it really makes me slow down and think, why am I making this image? Why is it important? What does it tell about this story? What does it tell about their life? What does it tell about their work? So with that limitation, I really try and, this is the phrase, click with the person before you click the shutter. Understand who they are. Why are you photographing? Why are you making those images? So. Now, throughout my personal life, um, I travel quite a bit, both for work and pleasure. And um, people who travel with me, and as, as you know, as you travel, doing photography on a trip can be a very personal thing. And it can also be a very great group experience. So as you interact with folks, you want people near you who understand what you're doing and why you do it. And they'll support you. And they'll let you sit there for an hour while the light gets good. So fortunately, I have a girlfriend who's super supportive of what I do. But she gets to a point where she gets impatient. And then this is what she does. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. And what she does is she walks in front of my camera, and she wears her hair in a bun. And then she just pops up in front of my lens. So all of our travels throughout Yosemite, Grand Canyon, here she is. She's like, hey, I'm here. Don't forget about me. So as you travel, you know, align yourself with other folks who support what you're doing, understand what you're doing. And uh, this is kind of our our photo album um, together you know, as we go. Other decisions I make while I travel, um, I really immerse myself in the culture. So down there uh, in the open grass, uh, there's some yurts. And this is in the steppe of Mongolia. Um, friend and colleague, uh, photographer there. 
But by living right there for weeks at a time, I'm a five minute walk from this kind of culture. And these are the kind of opportunities, seeing the daily life, seeing the sport. This is from Nottam Festival, um, a horse game. We're at a full gallop. It's about a 10 foot long stick. At a full gallop, they try and pick up the stick, grip it, lift it off the ground, and keep it. And I show the next picture, <coughs> excuse me, to really emphasize knowing your camera. Because you got the first picture, fast shutter speed, frozen action, you can see the emotion on the person's face. This one, panning, slow shutter speed. The pictures were made probably five minutes apart, but really knowing the technology and knowing the techniques can really give you interesting and, and more dynamic images. And then also, we're talking about uh, perspective, nature, um, let nature be your friend, uh, a hailstorm, how do you make it look even bigger, more grandiose, your perspective, I'm down to the ground, uh, make the sky look that much bigger. Another way that I get into cultures is through um, nonprofits. Nonprofits are usually um, on the ground, some of them are grassroots organizations, and they're really in tap with the local culture. And um, this image and the next couple are from Haiti. Uh, I went there with um, a small grassroots organization out of Chicago, and they visit Haiti and, and help with administrative or um, health care uh, throughout the year. And something interesting happened one time when I was there. I was staying with the host family, a husband and wife. And while I was visiting, um, the gentleman's mother died, which was a tragic event, super well loved in the community. But he came up to me and he said, look, you're going to be here during the funeral. It would be an honor if you come and photograph that for me. So suddenly, by being immersed in this culture and being with them, they opened up this amazing event. I was super nervous to do it. But it offered a really unique um, chance to see something I never would have. And of course, I go in. Um, I do my best, best job that I can and just present these pictures to him so that um, um, he has that for, for longevity. So. Um, also, with travel decisions, a lot of what I do um, in the personal work is I try and find really, really unique um, organizations or opportunities, travel opportunities, one of which I'll show is in Laos, um, which I visited, um, where they, they help um, elephants who have been in the logging industry, and they rehab them, um, give them a better life. But the access that they provide, we li literally live in the jungle um, with the mahouts, which are the trainers, which you see right there, and, and you, see, you see the bathing, you see the veterinarian action, um, you see the training happening. And this is, this is travel. This is just immersive travel, really, really unique experiences. And then as I photograph this for personal, I think, you know, what's the narrative? Where's the sense of place? Who are the characters? Where are the details? How do you show that relationship? And then also, how do you get moments? Um, how do you get those special moments that just like, um, uh, throughout the time. And then another example um, is uh, Volcanoes National Park um, in East Africa. Um, I went there uh, for a gorilla trek experience. And it was just a, a personal trip, but, but being with rangers who know how to get you close to the wildlife um, and interact and observe them, they say from a safe distance, but you can't always control when they come up to you, as I'll illustrate in a second. But uh, yeah, you can really see, I mean, adolescence going at it, um, dominance, personality, and just interesting moments. It's like being a kid. Um, young gorillas just playing around, and environmental portraits. Uh, and all of these things, even though they're wildlife, the same things I think about when photographing people, you can apply to wildlife. The personality, the gesture, the interaction, um, uh, the portraits, the uh, family structure. And then how close can you get? I don't have many pictures of myself because I'm behind the camera. But this was a park ranger said, hey, 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 there's a gorilla behind you. Just crouch down. The gorilla was actually about 10 yards behind me. I said, OK, sure, whatever. And I hear click, click, click. And I think, OK, she's done. I stand up. Her eyes get really, really big. 
She goes, no, 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 crouch down, crouch down, crouch down. And I did again, and then all I heard was thump, 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 <laughs> coming up behind me. And, um, but these are I mean, magical, magical um, experiences that you can make um, you know, just by, by putting yourself into particular positions. Uh, so now um, what I do in a lot of my professional work, I spend about three months of the year on the road. Um, I teach for National Geographic Expeditions, Limbaugh Expeditions, and the Student Expeditions Program. And what's great about them is they help to create these experiences for you. Um, very unique here in Cambodia with Apsara dancers, um, a dinner and entertainment, and beautifully lit architecture. Um, and then really getting into, into people's lives. I didn't have to knock on doors for this one. The doors have already been opened. And um, yeah, this one here is with a 35 millimeter uh, prime lens. Um, extremely close to her. Uh, but this was an opportunity where we spent about maybe 15 minutes with her, understanding her life, her family structure, how she works, how she make it, makes ends meet. Um, yeah, and downstairs, uh, downstairs in the, in the house as well. Play on work and life with Phnom Penh uh, in the background there. The worker here. And as I do these trips, I, I come back to that one point. Imagine a photographer knocking on your door, saying, hey, can I, can I see your life? I think about this, where I show up in people's homes. This is his work environment. This is a school. I think, man, do people from other countries come to America? Do they enter our schools? Do they go into people's workplaces? Are they that interested in our way of life? Because I know I am um, when I go overseas. So it's a really unique opportunity to get close to people. Um, I'm literally sitting on the bed. This is the bedroom um, of their house while they're harvesting flowers. And in private moments um, in the temples as well, hanging out with street vendors and uh, yeah, getting a real glimpse at, a real glimpse at like having a picnic. If you saw the latest King Kong movie, that uh, background might look familiar to you in Vietnam, and in uh, Cambodia uh, at the killing fields. So one of the things I do uh, with expeditions is I really try and plan um, kind of unique opportunities. Um, lesson learned from here, <coughs> uh, just waiting for things to happen. We were with a group of people, about 20 of us, and we were all rappelling into this Mulan this cave within, uh, within a glacier in Iceland. And I was just waiting, waiting, waiting. Every single person that it came down had a black jacket on, or a blue jacket, or a purple jacket. It was very similar to the photograph with my brother on the bow of the ship. So like 19 times I sat there and I was photographing. When's the moment going to happen? The 20th time our guide came down, nice red jacket, complements the blue really well. And at one instant, he just leans his head back, starts to drink the melting water off the glacier and gets illuminated. Um, so just stick with things. Um, really, really try and stick with things as you photograph. Um, and then before I go um, to travel, I do a lot of personal research. Where am I going? Where can interesting opportunities be? And here's just one example. This is in Edinburgh. I thought, OK, I'm going to have some time during the day. It's going to be sunny. Where can I go and make interesting pictures? And I found that there's this mirror maze part of a camera obscura uh, exhibit and building. And I literally just hung out in the mirror maze. Cool lights are coming in, depth, action, emotion. Um, just if you can think ahead of time where you can put yourself to make interesting pictures, you have a better chance of, of executing that. Because as a street photographer or just going out into culture, we're asking a lot for so many different things, so many different elements to come together and line up light, action, layers, color. Um, so if you can start to think about where can I put myself um, to make those images the better. Another example here, Edinburgh Castle. Uh, this is the military tattoo performance. Uh, a bunch of military bands from around the world come and perform. And before attending the event, I watched it on YouTube from the previous year. I studied where was I going to sit? When do things happen? When is the light going to be just right? When do these fireworks go off? When do the motorcycle stunt riders come out? And I was ready, just ready for it. Um, so I have a whole series of pictures of all the motorcyclists coming out. But this is the one that I was hoping for. I kind of envisioned that before I even went there. 
so that I had a better chance of success because I have one chance at it. This is going to happen one time and just be ready for it. And I, and I knew that um, going into it. So um, with all of these pictures, as we go out in, in the digital age, we're making thousands of pictures a day. Um, it's important to know that they're being processed properly. So I usually work off an iMac. That's the um, main computer, the desktop. And then I have a laptop as well that I go for assignments or through the, uh, the expeditions. And there was one time I had to file images, mm -hmm. so a long time ago, um, on assignment from location. And I took my laptop there, I shot everything, I submitted them to the editor, I brought the laptop home, and I just happened to have the same pictures right next to each other between the desktop and the laptop, and the color was completely off. And I thought, oh my god, what did I just send the editor? So I started to integrate um, color management um, into my um, workflow. And one of the things that I use is the um, Spider 5 um, from Data Color. It helps to color calibrate the monitors because you know what you saw, you know what the color should be, um, you know what kind of light source you were seeing. So you want to make sure that your picture, when you send it to the printer or if you're working to your editor or the creative director, that what you're providing is actually what was real. Um, so this is something that I use. Super easy product to use, um, software to install. It walks you step by step through everything. And um, yeah, very simple. Um, hanging in front of your monitor, um, a bunch of different prop prompts. It doesn't take more than five to 10 minutes, the initial time to set up. And about once a month, there's a little prompt, hey, you can recalibrate your monitor. And now I have computers um, all across the board um, that are all calibrated perfectly. So something that I use, um, a little tip for you guys that might be helpful. Um, and yeah, that's what I do. Um, so if you guys have any questions um, about what I talked about or anything else that I didn't talk about, I'm a total open book. Uh, I'm happy to answer anything. So.